programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. to everybody thank you once again for joining us on our sunrise safari no, not much of a sun this morning as you see there's a lot of cloud cover but it's quite warm around here at Juma private game reserve here in Wasabi Sand South Africa good morning everybody my name is Cedric and behind the camera with me on Rusty we've got Bika and once again we are joined by of course a beautiful and most knowledgeable and Dr. Andrea Marie Potgita of course conservation psychologist and thanks for joining us again this morning yeah, thank you to be here and we're going to get some more information from her this morning i'm sure and we are just going to go and bumble around and see what we can find this morning and see what conservation what nature has done for a lot of people in their mental health conditions and it's always it's always nice listening to your stories and your explanations and i'm sure we are all looking forward to that this morning once again thank you all right, so joining us this morning here on a Wendy, we're going to have a Rex and an OD up in Pridelands. Who's it? Chris and uh, Chris and Panda, <laughs> Chris and Panda in Pridelands, in Madikwe, of course, in the northwestern area of South Africa. Andrew and Paul, but as you can see, it is a live and interactive show. So if you've got any comments or questions or even suggestions for us this morning. And you are watching on the Wild Earth website. Make sure that you do register with us so you can send those comments and questions through. So I don't know what I'm trying to plan my morning. Um, I'm really keen to see if we can find some rosettes this morning. Uh, we haven't had any rosettes yesterday, in other words, any leopards. Um, but we didn't hear anything calling. I did not have a single track yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon on our sunset safari. So, you never know what's been playing throughout the night. And, well, I'm starting off here at the beautiful Treehouse Dam. So, we're just going to sit here a little bit and listen out and enjoy the scenery. Uh, very good morning to you, Anna Marie. Thank you so much for joining us once again, as always, on our Sunrise Safari. And yes, I'm hoping that we can get some uh, felines, Feline Friday. Oh, there goes a hummercop. Uh, as you can see, hey, look at that. What a great start. A hummercop in flight, making its way maybe to another watering hole, maybe towards Twin Dams, or maybe just behind there. <laughs> right, not all the way there. It looks like he dived into uh, the drainage line area. Of course, I'm sure he's going to go look for some frogs, some fish. I love the hummercorp and I love when they do that little shuffle. You know me. The hummercorp shuffle is the best shuffle on earth. But yes, I think uh, BK might do, he's good with these um, uh, shuffles as well. So I'm sure BK might one day do a hummercorp shuffle with me in one of the pans. Yes, Morgan, I know I haven't done a hummercorp shuffle in a while, uh, in a while because I think uh, I've got a bad knee. No, I'm just joking, I don't have a bad knee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, you never know. Hummercorp shuffle, you need to be quite uh, quite fit and uh, to get that shuffle going. But yeah, that's what I was saying. I thought maybe BK will be joining me and encourage me to get into one of these wallows very soon. We shall see. <laughs> 
<laughs> VK is like just shaking his head like that. It ain't gonna happen. All right, while well, the morning is still young, and um, I think uh, let's uh, continue with our early morning safari and see what we can find. As I said, I'm hoping to get some uh, cats on a feline Friday. Feline Friday. I don't know where this feline Friday comes from. It's like the tawny Thursdays. <laughs> anyway, while we're gonna continue, let's see what the weather is like all over today. It's the start of another lovely day. Right here at Pridens. Pridens Conservancy. And our plan this morning is to perhaps try and figure out where the lions have gone to. That's going to be our initial plan. We're going to crisscross the area, drive up and down, see if there's any lion tracks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm with me on camera ops. It's still Mr. Panda Glitz. Still operating the camera there. And like I said, our plan is to try and find some cats, specifically lions. And we're going to basically start from where we are in the central parts. Going to go a little bit south and east and then northwards. And we're going to move in a zigzag pattern very slowly in the search of tracks, specifically of lions. But I'm hoping to find some fresh leopard tracks as well. And we're also just waiting for the sun to rise, which will happen in a few minutes. As you can see, there is a little bit of clouds. It's not totally overcast, but it is partly cloudy and very comfortable at the moment. I was expecting a very cold morning, but it's just cool at the moment. Not, I won't say it's cold. And I cannot hear any sounds other than impala and birds at the moment. So that young male lion that we saw yesterday went further northwest. Not going to head to that area immediately. I first want to see if there's not perhaps any other sign of the lions. Good morning, Cindy D. Good morning to all. <coughs> and, um, also would like to go and see if that herd of buffalo is still around. Not only would it be nice to see that herd of buffalo, but very often when these buffalo are around, we find the Ngati pride, or at least a portion of them, are kind of like following that herd of buffalo look for an opportunity to perhaps snatch a young buffalo somewhere. So if we can find the buffalo and move back on their tracks, there is sometimes a chance of finding some lion tracks as well, or even sometimes the actual lions. Leopard lover reckons today's the day. Pixie Pan, Tinkerbell, <coughs> or even Lagertha. And just for our new viewers, the names mentioned there. The Pixie Pan female is one of the resident female leopards in the area. And she's got two suppertled cubs who's now kind of like started to move on their own. And we've named them. Tinker Bell and Peter Pan. It's a male and a female. They're about getting close to two years old now. Lagertha, on the other hand, is a lioness that originated from the Ngati pride, but her mother was unfortunately killed by some males when she was basically still a cub. And she managed to survive on her own quite a story and she was 
basically stranded around a water hole by herself. And she survived by eating rodents, mongoose, hares, all sorts of small things. And ultimately managed to become a fully grown lioness. Still moves by herself a lot, but occasionally she does rejoin the Ngati pride. But she acts very much like a leopard. Climbs trees, sleeps in trees. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, quite a character. She is Lagatha. I know we often mention names of some of our characters out here. And I know we, we constantly have new viewers. I just thought I'll give a short background on what those names are about. Yeah. It's going to wait for the sun to rise. In the meantime, let's quickly head over to Rex and see what he's up to. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome here yeah, at the beautiful morning uh, show at uh, Juma Safari Live. It's really, really amazing and beautiful here yeah, where the wise we were following tracks of uh, male lion that cross into this area and we're still looking around here yeah, if is anything that we might come across here. Yeah. From a south direction and Owen behind the camera, we are looking for a great beautiful morning searching all different uh, interesting uh, sort of sightings that might be taking place in the area. It's a lovely, lovely morning. Of course, we find tracks of uh, a young male all the way down coming from Gary Dam, the same man that we reported around 4 o'clock early this morning. His tracks is going across into Manieleti and it looked like he joined up with another male that uh, uh, went across. You will never know from this stage whether it could be SH male because we had a report between the two males, S8 and um, Mohawk. This young male that is nomadic, he gets in between and switch. The freedom of movement in between the two males. He partner with this one and he come to the west and partner with the other one. So it looks like tracks come from here and head that direction. It could be S8 male, it could be another young male. That, uh, it happens that they get together, they're becoming nomadic now at the moment because they have no trophy all the time. Maybe they have kicked out from the resident pride due to their age or due to new males that take over on a territory and now start to move and wander around looking for the opportunity of surviving themselves and opportunity of an area that is grey land to take over from these dominant males. You'll never know. One day soon, end of uh, next month, we'll be able to tell exactly the stats of these uh, lions around in the area, who's settling here and who's not, because the dynamic Kabeki, welcome. Thank you for joining us for the morning. It's a little bit chilly here. Yeah, it's nice. It still gives that uh, um, ability for all cats to move around in the area non-stop for the rest of the day. It's overcast, a little bit chilly, breezy. I like it. We are checking here at uh, uh, Triple M. We had, there was activities of wild dogs. You know wild dogs, it's overcast like this. They're non-stop going anymore. But uh, for me to check uh, the, the boundaries of the, our conservancy from the west, north, east, and uh, also south. If there's anything, we'll be able to let you know and follow up. And we know that to the east of our conservancy, there were herds of buffalo. sometimes imagine what Wild Earth would be like without adverts? A chance to properly immerse yourself in nature without any interruptions. Sign up to be an explorer for a small monthly fee 
and you can truly escape into the wilderness. Ad Free Viewing is now available on our app as well as on our website. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. How beautiful is this to see this uh, beautiful male Niala busy feeding and of course the females following this behind him. But yes, you know, Wild Earth's mission is to connect the world with nature. So if you would like to help, just pop onto our website, wildearth.tv and uh, just click on the donate button. There are some private safaris. If you donate a hundred US dollars and more with a choice three guides, Lauren, Steve or myself, Cedric. Of course the goal for the month is 11,000 US dollars for June. If we do reach that goal, of course some of the guides will show off their best bush, uh, bush survival skills. So yes, I'm hoping that we reach that uh, target and can get some amazing bush skills. Alright, as you can see that uh, female Neolist is still roaming around in the back end beautiful colors so it's just so the stripes that come down on the flanks to really break the outline of the body especially when they go in the thick vegetation that's a hard yeah but that's them they are gone bye bye all right let's move on there they are they have as quick as they were yeah as quick as they left So now I'm just heading a little bit further uh, east. I'm coming to Chelapan. I see there's a lot of line tracks on top of our vehicle tracks here. And small and small tracks as well. A lot of line tracks going this. I know that we had the mail yesterday, yeah, but I drove on this road and we did squash his tracks yesterday. So if it was for years, but there's more line tracks here. But let's take a look. We are at Chelapan. Just have to. Maybe scan this area. Might be maybe that young male that was on dam cam this morning. It might be for him. Let's quickly look around this area. Chiller pan. Nothing here. Uh, maybe they went a little bit further south. Let's double check on this here quickly. Mm, no, it doesn't look like any tracks. I think that. I think that uh, the track that I saw there now might be for that one male that we saw yesterday around Chilapan. He might have been just back and forth, back and forth, and uh, headed up towards Gary Dam and then went north 
but we still will look around this area. Maybe there might be others that are lying in the vicinity. Andrea, it's lovely the mornings. I feel always fresh in the morning. I love, I think morning to me is one of the nicest times of the day. I don't know. I love, that's why I'm always up so early in the morning, cup of coffee. What do you think? It's well, I, well, especially here, I think the mornings are a sensorial awakening. It's mm. your sense, all your senses wake up and especially in this kind of environment, you just start smelling all the nuances of nature. That's it. So. And it is, and I love it. And I'm, like, as you're saying, all the senses are waking up. And I think for myself, I think my first sense is uh, a sense of uh, almost like taste, almost. Mm. Yeah, coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I need that first, uh, first uh, cup of coffee in the morning. Then, I'm, then every, all the other senses starts, uh, starts wakening up after that. <laughs> uh, sorry, Morgan, I didn't catch what you said there. Alright, while well, we are going to continue searching around this area, let's head over to Pridelands as they've got a beautiful sunrise that side. Alright, sun is up. <clears throat> sun is up. And it's going to rise quickly now. But just in time for us to have this beautiful scene laying out in front of us and um, soon after this we will we'll continue with oh there's a buffalo it's my snow buddy you see him there Banda just to the right uh, <laughs> I heard him last night he was close to my tent again okay and he just bingles around in camp. Now he's decided, no, today I think I need to move a bit into the bush. I'm a buffalo after all. There he goes. <laughs> I heard him last night. He was, he was, it was just the, uh, between my tent and, um, and, and Panda's tent for a while. I'm not sure why he likes my tent so much. No, he decides that. Today I've had enough of the camp and the students and Chris. So I am now going to be a buffalo and I'm going to head out into the bush. Well, that's a nice start, you know, setting up a sunset and having a little buffalo surprise. Yeah, definitely on a mission, this fellow. We should call him something, give him some name. <laughs> Sir 50, stunning. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a source of great entertainment in camp. Even last night, I remember we were having dinner and he was just milling around in camp. Now, like, we, we need to be very careful of this buffalo. You know, even though he's not aggressive or anything, it's still a buffalo, you know. So uh, we, we make sure we all got torches and, you know, if you can see him at a distance, you don't want to move around a tent on the way to, let's say, the, you know, the dinner table or something and you suddenly, uh, the two meters in front of him, he, you know, it's still a buffalo and still needed to be treated with uh, the necessary respect because it, it is a dangerous, potentially dangerous animal. And we do not have any fence around our camp. Hi, Jane. Yeah, it's my buddy indeed. Still thinking of a fitting name for him. How about some suggestions from you? Let me know if you think what would be a perfect name for my snow buddy.
I thought of calling him BK, but I don't think BK is going to like it. I'm not going to tell you why. Well, I can. It's because the noises they make at night are on par with each other. <laughs> BK is going to come and smack me next time he's down here. No, he's not BK. We need to give him another name. He's gone. He's moved off. Well, let's take a last look at the sun before we head out on our intended search for cats. And obviously, as we go along, <clears throat> we're going to be looking for any topic that we can discuss. As you know, I do like to discuss a variety of things ranging from plants to insects and anything that presents that are interesting. WE has a suggestion there that I hear right. Is it Brutus or Rufus? This is my apologies, my comments just Brutus, 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 Brutus. I like that. I like that. Brutus. He does look like a Brutus, eh? Panda's chuckling. He likes it. We'll run it past the buffalo and see how he reacts. <laughs> He's not going to even know what, what, the, what we're saying anyway. No, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Oh, it is a lovely morning. I must say, I was expecting a very cold day. Uh, according to all the uh, forecasts, it would have been a cold day, but it feels quite mild today, I must say. Jane wants to call him Bob. Also, very nice. <laughs> now he's, he's, he's boss, boss. Okay, boss, boss. Sorry, uh, boss. That sounds good. Brutus or boss? Gosh, these suggestions are great. The suggestions are very, very, very fitting. Well, whatever you're going to call him, he's gone now. Laura Cam wants to call him Wim. Yeah, I like that even, even more. <laughs> Wim. <laughs> that means uncle. in my language. That's, that's very cool, in fact. I like that a lot as well. Brutus, boss, or um. I like um, actually. How about um, Brutus? <laughs> right. Thank you for all those suggestions, guys. It's uh, appreciated. <laughs> right. So back to our plan. I'm going to head towards uh, Twin Pans. It's just east of us and then straight north from there. 
and hopefully we'll be able to find some land tracks. Thank you. Look at the wonderful, wonderful rhinos. The all three here look like a male and the all three males and the young um, rhino to far into the bush we cannot able to see. Such amazing beautiful species as you can see. The male tend to be like dominating. You can tell that in most cases uh, it's really amazing. The uh, dominant male all the time what does he try to head the female in his favor all the time you can see that if female goes out of his uh, area he try to push them a little bit more deep into his territory and that is the nature of a male especially if he discover that the female she will be in oestrus not so long he try as much as he can to secure that particular female not for other male to access that female in order to mate you tend to see that um, male rhino love to all the time really stay behind the female but yeah it's very interesting the female that she's very old i don't think she can even go for uh oestrus uh she's like almost towards the end of the life and uh, we know that uh, she's been around here we have a lot of uh, history information with this particular female She's been caught in a fire before. She's been on lots of things that happened to her around the area. She stays around with one uh, sub-adult, which uh, at the moment it does give a little bit of uh, secure for the female and able to know if we want to find her because lonely female to track, it could be a little bit difficult, but uh, two, three, listen. There's line calling, not far from Via Teller. A dam, but I believe that um, we ever on a dam at the moment, you can tell us how far, definitely. I had these lines calling. Maybe they're still behind the uh, breeding heart of Buffalo. What we need to do is to go for Buffalo. Destinations are still going to Garden Corn just now on Central, heading in an easterly direction. And I believe that uh, it will be something that uh, after this we need to follow up on the buffalo and able to know exactly where they are. Very interesting. Uh, morning, I mean, if a lion calls early in the morning like this, it means a lot. It could be territorial, it could be challenging because most, most, most especially lions, you, you tend to um, really hurt them at night after sunset, but early part of the morning, it will be something that they're uh, talking about. Cool, look at this, beautiful. Anna Marie, she's happy to see Rhino. Thanks Anna Marie, to join us also this morning. Lovely, it is um, great. We seen Rhino also yesterday with the calf. It makes uh, ourselves happy. It looks like uh, something is really taking place. You can see all these uh, rhinos be dehorn. We know that uh, the pandemic around the era, but rhino poaching and all that, it's really, really driving us insane. But uh, what can you do? This is how actually we can uh, pre prevent uh, from poaching is to horn. And all of them, the weather of March will travel from both angles that no more horns the runner that moves into the area. Now runner stay safety by that way. So I will thanks the management of the reserve for this decision. It's unbelievable now. We can see everything is stabling and the runner movement and the population will start to generate again. Rana is one of the species that eat um, grass all the time. They collect 
at least 150 uh, foliage a day and uh, really is one of the species that uh, love most of the time to be I mean, around water holes. As you can see from here, no farm, three houses not far uh, to the other side. So all the time they will be going from one water hole to another or any pens that might be really important for them to wallow and able to get water. With that water, with that water they cannot do well. And from Rano, let us take it, this opportunity over to Andrew. Iconic African mammals live large in humanity's imagination. Across the continent, fascinating mammals have evolved to fill every conceivable niche. Their struggles for survival, natural and anthropogenic, mirror those of wildlife the world over. Because they are so beguiling, Africa's mammals have become ambassadors for the Earth's remaining wilderness. All right, we have located on a big herd of a buffalo. Look at this big boy. Uh, but I do apologize for losing uh, Madikwe. I think they just went through a terrible uh, signal spot there. But don't worry, you are still with us and uh, what a find for the morning. And on top of that, guess where we are? We are exactly at the same spot where the lions took down that other young buffalo the other morning or evening. Morning or e morning. And we had a whole pride of lion tracks coming directly into this area as well. So. We never know what's going to play out here, but these buffaloes for now seem very relaxed. It's a beautiful herd, and I'm just going to keep a close eye. Maybe there might be something lurking in the background. But look at that, all spread out at the moment. So, because they're so spread out for now, um, it pretty much means that they don't feel threatened by any predators like the lions. If there is any threat, you'll find that these buffaloes will really kind of congregate much closer together and act as one to try and push those lions off. But for now, it's nice just to see this set of buffalo lying down. You can see some of them still resting on the ground there. Some big boys, some nice males, some younger males, some females, some calves. It's all happening here at the junction. We will call this function at the junction. But usually they will still rest for a little bit and then of course once that sun starts coming up and starts heating up uh, the area, then we'll find the buffaloes and will become a little bit more active and they will try and go and Look for a nice watering hole. We're going to have an early morning drink, but for now, it seems like they are just very much relaxed. Oh, there's one horn. Oh, no, there's one. No, it looked like it had one horn. So you got pretty much a nice two females there at the back end, and then of course the one far right is a male. So you'll find between the males, the male's got a very thick boss, a big boss on the head, like the horns is very thick, where the females have got a nice thin. Thin, thin horn, so you'll see that's a female there that's underneath there, and that's a male that we're looking at, but there's a female just in front of that male. There's a male and female. I would like to be a buffalo, because you're going to get pestered by lions all the time. What do you think, Andrea? 
Sure. Well, I don't know. Those horns are pretty impressive. I wouldn't mind having a pair of those. <laughs> <laughs> having a pair of horns. <laughs> Jeffrey, which animal has the strongest calming effect? Andrew, do you, would you like to, for yourself now? What is what animal is a nice calming has a calming effect to you? Well, I think to, uh, that is a really good question. Actually, it I've is. never thought of that. Yeah. I think it depends on the person. So I don't think there's a general animal. But as I said yesterday, a lot of the research shows that birds, the bird song, yeah. has a calming effect. Yeah. But I think it depends on the person, so you really need to figure out for yourself. What yeah. animal has a calming effect on you? Ah, uh, the buffalo ramming my vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds traumatic. <laughs> I think that's got the opposite effect. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the animal that's got a calming effect on me, I think, sure, yeah, I agree with you. Birds is definitely one of those things where you can just sit and watch a bird and really have that, you know, that, that feel of, uh, how can I say, that serene feel, you know what I mean? And um, I think cats, oh. I don't know. I love cats. I think, uh, look, I, I always loved leopard, a leopard since I was a kid. I love uh, a leopard. I think a leopard is, especially when they're lying in a tree, when they're lying on top of a termite mound, it's just so, they seem just so kind of calm to me. It feels like I can be just as calm. So, and I've also kind of got a lot of, I can just say, um, the patience. I, I realized patience and I, I learned a lot of patience from animals. Wow. I think, you know, seeing a, uh, seeing a leopard being so patient, seeing lions being so patient when, when they're on a hunt, and being so calm at some uh, some, uh, some stages, yeah. I kind of uh, realised that yeah maybe a cat's sure. cat's is my calming animal. Oh. Mm. I actually, now that I think of it, for me, I go to the ocean when I think mm. of calming. So I'm thinking of a pajama shark. Pajama shark. Yeah, they're not big. I mean, they're not like this. They're quite small. Okay, and yeah. when you snorkeling above a pajama shark, just the way they're moving through the water is uh, actually quite calming. All when right. You watch them, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, they're also, they're still wearing the pajamas. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. well, maybe a zebra should be a calming one for us. Yeah, <laughs> because they they still wear, wearing their pajamas. So, yeah, yeah. Ah, fantastic pajama shark. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like there's a nice big male. I don't know if you can look at that one, BK, like down the road. It looks like a very grumpy male that's coming. There's, oh, there's yeah. two. There's, well, there's another one behind him. So you can see these big, big boys, at least a ton, weighing about a ton. And uh, these are the ones usually always moving on the outskirts of these herds. So in case that if there is any predators like the lions, you know, these guys will be like your first line of defense. So, you know, and you can imagine, like, it's, you can just look at the shoulders, look at those horns. And a lot of experience as well. Ooh, these two are, and a lot of testosterone as well going down there. So of course there is a pecking order in the buffalo. So there will be certain not one, but there will be several dominant males in this herd that will have the first right to mate with the females. And sometimes the sparring can be quite, quite vicious. These two horns locking. Hmm. A bit of playtime there, yeah. All right, while we are, well, while we're going to be sitting here with these uh, buffaloes and just uh, keep our eyes open for any line activity, I think let's head over to Madikwe to go and view the beautiful sunrise. Thanks, Cedric, and good morning, everybody from South Africa. Welcome to Madikwe on a very warm morning. We are very happy this morning because it feels like our noses and ears are not going to fall off from frostbite. Morning, everybody. My name is Andrew, and I'm Paul, just behind the camera. Hope everybody's well. And uh, we're starting off with one really beautiful sunrise. Look at that. Now, one thing I have noticed is the sunrise out, out here in the, in the northwest on Medique Game Reserve. It's incredibly orange. Um, it's probably one of the, the most orange I've ever seen the, the sunrises and sunsets. And um, I believe it's got to do with the way that the light, the light refracts out here. So it's got nothing to do with reflection or anything like that. It's got to do with the, the way the light refracts. Now, just an update. This morning it seems a little bit quiet. So what we're going to do is we're going to just you know, go and check dam, 
all the dams around so basically dam to dam and then um, just moments ago we heard some reports that some lions were heard roaring and so we're just going to give the chaps a chance to follow up there see if they can't manage to track those lions down in the meantime we are going to enjoy this western part of the reserve it's beautiful uh, so many different birds that are calling at the moment um, I can hear white-browed scrub robins and the Cape Glossy Starlings, Three-Banded Plover, Cape Turtle Dove or ring neck Dove. And moments ago was a grey heron just walking around here. Nancy, good morning, good morning. Nice to hear from you, Nancy. And welcome. Yeah, this is a beautiful sunrise safari this morning. I woke up this morning and my... You know, in Paul and I, we, we, we stuck our, our bodies outside the room for a moment and we thought, yeah, it's going to be cold this morning. Okay, let's go bundle up. So we bundled up and we set sail on our safari and uh, it's actually pretty warm this morning. And we are happy with the temperatures so far. Thanks to our wonderful Wild Earth Explorers, Wild Earth Kids is back. Your monthly subscriptions have allowed us to relaunch Wild Earth schools on a weekly basis, every Wednesday for the first hour of the Sunset Safari. You guys bring a smile to my face every single day. Sign your class up for a special virtual field trip to Africa, because touching the lives of the future protectors of our Earth truly matters. We're still here with uh, these uh, Cape Buffaloes and as you can see they're still, they haven't moved much for now. I'm still kind of scanning the area just to see if those lions are not close by. But clearly these buffaloes they are not phased about too much at the moment, no predators. But these, look at that old female to the left. You can just see just the way her horns are, even the coloration to her coat to her chin, it's gone to a bit of a, a greyish colour. So yes, some of the buffaloes you'll find once they start ageing. Uh, so you get those grey hairs that come through. And you can see that male behind her. He's showing a little bit of interest in that female, but she's got a calf that's right next to her. So she won't go into heat anytime soon. So I think he's just trying his luck.
to see quite a few, a few of them are still lying down on this nice, uh, comfortable road. You'll find even elephants, even uh, you'll, uh, rhinos, buffaloes, these big, heavy animals, they'll use the road as a oh, as a spot to lie down because uh, the sand is nice. And on top of that, the sand is soft. So they feel a little bit comfortable lying on on that. Michael, what is the best way to get into mental healing in the bush? Andrew? Well, <laughs> That's uh, another good question. Listen, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, um, well, for me at least, it's breathing. When you start just breathing when you're in the bush. So I quite like what's called box breathing, which is where you breathe in for five seconds. Okay, yeah. You hold it for five seconds. You breathe out for five seconds and hold it again for five seconds. And when you're in the bush doing that breathing, it helps you just connect with the silence and the smells and, and all of that. So in other words, like when you're breathing like that, when you do that five second, five second, yeah. so that you don't have that breathing noise in your ears. Yes. So you get that like that little bit of that silence. Yes, exactly. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, I must do that every morning. I must try that. Yeah. Well, not every morning, any time during the daytime. I think I, we shall do it now. No, but there's, there's too much noise around at the moment. I don't think that's going to happen. Eh? I think you've got you're gonna free be, diving. Yeah. <laughs> you need to breathe in. <laughs> <laughs> you were holding yeah. your breath. <laughs> oh, like a. Yeah, five seconds. Ah, breathe here. Hold for five seconds. And hold for five seconds. I feel that little bit of that little bit of peace to it, eh? Yes, it is. Well, if I'm not gonna, if I yes, if I have to talk about stuff and all that, and if I have a gap of about uh, maybe five minutes and I'm not talking, I'm busy doing those breathing box exercise, breathing. Bro yeah, the box breathing. There it is. <laughs> Thanks for that. Interesting. So yeah, this is another vehicle that's approaching us. I just want to see. Mm. A lot of Okay, I just want to quickly double check. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that they are going to be placed right there. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the name Bevan. Uh, Bevan, uh, yes, the buff. They've the, the the buffalo is very chill this morning. I think they've been doing box breathing this morning as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I think they are feeling very good. Uh, Evan, Evan, sorry, I thought it was Bevan. Thanks, Evan. So yeah, they are very chilled. I thought they might when I saw those lion tracks coming directly, the whole pride of lions coming directly into this area, um, and I saw these buffaloes. I thought, okay, we are going to get some action, but you never know. You know, things can change up very, very quickly. As you see, some of these buffaloes are still st lying down and relaxing for the morning. There's one or two that's actually gone further into uh, Juma, to exactly where those uh, lions made the kill uh, two days ago. So we shall just uh, listen out. And we'll pick up on uh, these buffalo's behavior very quickly if there is a lions around. But as you know, buffalo's they do not have territory, so they pretty much run on the home range. So you'll find that buffalo's will move throughout the entire park. Uh, they'll go where there's good grazing grounds, where there's nice water and of course they will move as one herd so they won't be in a set area like a territorial leopard or territorial lions they'll be in a set area and these buffaloes as well once they start moving they'll usually have the old females known as the pathfinders that will actually come out of move and find the next areas to go to as well as to a good watering holes are so they will kind of rely on their experience 
like this female that's coming there now. You can see. Oh, she might have a scratch. Let's see. Something. Yep. Maybe. There you go. A little scratch on the below the chin area. Of course, areas that they cannot get to. There we go. And usually now, like this time of the year, winter time, that's why these herds are so big because uh, a lot of them will, will amalgamate. So you'll get like little herds, little factions. They'll actually kind of join each other, and just to make bigger herds, uh, safety in numbers in winter time, especially when body conditions deteriorate because there's not as much grass around, and I rather want to then kind of have bigger herds moving together. Um, then summertime, once the water, once the rain comes, there's enough water, and enough grass, and of course they will separate and go into smaller pockets, mm -hmm. smaller herds. Mm. Oh, this big boy, uh, sorry, there's a male that's showing two big males here that's really moving here in front. You can see the two of them. One is not too happy with the other one. You can see that one at the back there. Oh, look at that dewlap under his chin. On his neck, it's like that skin that's hanging there. Mm. Very impressive. Oh, look, he's even doing the helicopter. He's urinating. Mm. You can see. And you can see anything, any noises, he's quickly he turns around and, and investigates. So he's definitely one of the dominant boys here. Great, lovely, we had to cut it down. At the same time, we reach here, we find this uh, hippopotamus and... Uh, we are willing to get to know exactly the order of the lines that we had earlier on when we were at uh, Garden Main, Ashibama Road. Sounds like a little bit no from here. Look at the hippos. They're all coming. Um, oh, this is those in garden closures when you came to the scenario last time. Some for your booger. I just want to do a loop around me. Um, they're all coming numbers. There's something with hippos. All the time they'll really prefer where it's quite a lot of water and stay there and they can able to really breed and trust the water if it's not gonna be a shot during the uh, very dry season which is uh, uh, winter so at the moment you can see them the hippo that stays here is now in business is happy it's got company if mating has to take place he will mate but if water goes short or if water gets uh, dry what's going to happen that particular female, she has to be in the same water hole until she gives birth and the youngster able to get to a certain stage sub, as a sub-adult, where if she moves into different rafts of the hippo, she's, she's going to be safe. Otherwise, you know that hippopotamus male are becoming dominant and they are like lions. They cannot allow the female come with the youngster. In their own pool, a raft of the hippo, or the own water hole that he's living as a dominant. It's a very difficult life, of course, as a hippo, because you can't live on land. If you live on land without water, it's a problem. We had to, we had to tell her, Gary Dam, as you can see. Great, lovely. A dominant male hippo is always showing dominance. You can see the all hippo, all class together, he's more on the side. It shows that he doesn't make any noise. That shows that uh, it's nothing serious that he has to do within the um, females. So it's much fun that the female have youngster already or big enough. They're not going to uh, really mate at the moment. It's something that a hippo has to be an oestrus in order to mate. A dominant male is always like a lion. 
A male lion is always ready, guarding. If a female she enter into mating cycle, then he can mate. A male doesn't go to estrus or mass, doesn't have that period. It's only the female that do have period uh, that has to be really get interested on mating. That's this, that's raising these guys are so much protective when it comes to uh, females. Because chances of mating, it only come once. If you lose that chance of mating, uh, it's for good. And that's raising the so much protecting on the female. Because losing that opportunity, it means is nothing that can come. Especially if you find a male hippo like him, who does have two, three females that are living in the water hole or pond, that means that he has to be strictly <coughs> Divey age 8 years, hippo communicate uh, like an elephant, more especially in and out of water. <coughs> they have so-called scent mark. They also scent. You see the defecation of a hippo that uh, all the time, even inside water, it do a uh, defecation. Out in the bush, you see quite a lot of defecation on the side of the uh, bushes. That is how, how they communicate. Inside water, they also communicate with the sound, the vocal box that they do. <laughs> they travel with the vibration of water. Even if it's down, you can know what's going on in that communication, and they can able to really respond one another. If it's aggression, they have to be aggressive. They have to be um, all of them participate. If they see something danger, they will be uh, really respond them at the same time. You know that uh, hippo doesn't like uh, lions or any any predators that might be coming close to the water. The reason behind that because they do have youngsters that can be so much vulnerable from lions and other species as concerned as one of the uh, predators of course. It's beautiful animals, but especially hippo we find them out of water. The structure that they have very heavy heavy species. The belly is always touching the ground and they can run very fast. 45 km per hour is one of the species that kills a lot of more people in entire Africa because if you get between them you challenge fight. So all the time also when you get down to the river or dam think about hippo because sometimes they do have motions against human beings especially walking in the area they can simply attack you. They're very quiet this morning. There's nothing, as I said, to contest. There's no other hippo, there's no female trying to be settled and be quiet and not making quite a lot of noise. In the uh, raft of the hippo, where there's a lot of hippo, there's quite a lot of communication, especially with the dominant male a lot of communication in the female to make sure that it must, mustn't be a male that gets into the pond. Know that in this specific area there is a dominant male who control all the female. If I go to cheat to cheetah now, each and every less than five minutes there will be communication over hippos because they are spread out at the dam, at the dam itself. One is on that corner having youngster, one that there, two are mating there. So all the time it's a communication, they communicate. You can see that uh, all the time the head sticking out or the nostrils sticking out to help to breathe in and out. All oh, most of the wildlife species they don't sleep uh, over seven hours like we do, five, six, seven hours like we do. Now these guys they can sleep only for five minutes is enough. You know that all the time he has to be always alert with coming. It's not only the lions that can be troubling this. Think about uh, elephants. Think about uh, Arana hippo. It's a bigger threat. If he comes, if you sleep, he will be surprised and get killed. You know that uh, you snooze, you lose. If you snooze, you're going to lose because you will be hunted easily. Oh, beautiful, beautiful water home. 
I was listening at the same time while we were talking here. There's nothing that's taking place. No lions calling. Let's uh, try to go and find ourselves. What's going on there at the cut line? We were right at the... We were right at the uh, north, but we didn't take the cut line. Uh, the lines might be somewhere close by. We, look, we have already got to the south. Let's take this opportunity. Over to Cedric, who is looking for lines around the buffalo. So there's still no change yet at the buffaloes. Um, the only thing it looks like, it seems like quite a few, a few of them are now moving in an easterly direction. In other words, they're not coming into Juma, they are heading into another property called the Torch Wood. And of course, a property that we cannot traverse. But there's still some that's lying down, but you'll find as soon as the that herd starts moving, it really is pretty much like a domino effect. Everybody else will get up. But it's always nice sitting with the uh, buffaloes. I always love it. And especially for me, I'm talking about now mental health and smells and sounds and all that. And also one of the things to me is the smell of buffalo, mm -hmm. the smell of dung, you know, smell of buffaloes moving through uh, grass, you know, mm -hmm. uh, kicking up some uh, dust. You know, you get that typical that bush smell to a lot of it. And I feel that it brings back a lot of memories and it always kind of puts my mind into that well i'm back in the bush it's amazing how a person's mental side of things actually works that way you know where and it's good for you i think isn't it andrew yeah absolutely there's what is called the biodiversity hypothesis and when they researched it what it showed was like you said the dust that's being kicked up and all of that there's microorganisms that actually sit in the dust in the leaves yeah. And then when you breathe it in, it actually goes into your microbiota in your yeah. stomach. Yeah. And that's linked to your psyche. So whenever you're breathing in biodiverse spaces, you're actually helping with your mental health just by breathing in the dust or the dung. Or, yeah. you know, so those microorganisms go into your body and helps you. That's fantastic. Eh? So that's why I always say, feel that. I mean, that's how I feel, you know, when I'm driving into the park. I mean, I could come from the town or city. And all of, a, all of a sudden, I get into uh, like the Kruger or come here back uh, uh, to the Sabi Sands, and I pick up on this beautiful smell of uh, the, the dust, uh, the smell of dung, smell of buffalo. And uh, all of a sudden, I just get so excited. I feel like, well, you know, um, my mind just gets set back into this routine again. And I think I love this routine. I love being here because to me, it feels like I'm so at one with nature. And I think we all have to be. I yeah. think it, it's it's good for our, our mental health. It's good for our happiness. It's good for, um, especially for people suffering like uh, lonesome, depression, and all that. Yeah. I think this kind of thing will help out quite a bit. You know what I mean? Go into the bush and yeah. get that smells, get those noises, everything yeah. like that. I think it's lovely. Absolutely. It's amazing to know these things, and that's why it's lovely having you, you know, on the drives in it and yeah. explaining all about uh, these uh, these facts in it. Yeah. So knowledgeable with that, love it. <laughs> but it looks like some of the buffaloes now are heading here. So they, the buffaloes are a bit confusing us here. So some of them went a little bit further we, uh, east into Torchwood. And now you got uh, one of the, how can I say, ends of the buffaloes is actually now heading more in a southwesterly direction into Juma. So I guess we'll have to see which ones are going to go, going to go where because the way those ones are going, it's a good thing coming to Juma maybe. As I said, maybe the lions might be in here. We're not too sure. I haven't really gone to track further on that pride of lions, but we might actually head down very shortly, a little bit further south down this road to see what we can find. As long as I know I'm on the right side of the hunt this time. I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna have the buffalo <laughs> ramming my vehicle. But I wasn't funny enough on the right side last time, but it's just because it's night time. So sometimes yes. at night, you know, you know with us, we don't use any spotlights or anything like that. So of course we mainly use infrared. So of course with the, with the infrared and all that, it is, uh, you know, uh, I can just say, you don't know what's happening next to you because if the camera is pointed away, 
and all the buffaloes are on that one side and uh, at night time it can be a little bit more trickier because you know especially if your lions are chasing buffaloes all all over the show especially in front of the vehicle and coming around to the side and you're still looking at the ones on the left hand side and then the next moment you have that surprise so yeah night time hunts you've got to be awake yeah, yeah. That's why you always have to plan your stuff. Sorry, Morgan, my earpiece just fell out because of all the action we're having here. Emma, age is seven. Good morning. Why do buffaloes moo so much? Well, it's like most animals. A lot of animals will just uh, have that communication between one another and a little bit of a grunt and a, a bellow in that. So, yes, it's all just communication. Sometimes they find that uh, they're just uh, having a disagreement with uh, the other one and sometimes they'll let out as well a funny uh, grunting and noise. But it's all communication. You must remember animals communicate, especially when they're in these big herds. You look at uh, elephants, they've got that low rumble, really a fantastic way of communication and their communication travels quite a distance. Um, so in the same with, uh, with these buffaloes, they'll be mooing all the time and just making sure that all the individuals in these herds do understand what's happening and when things have to be moving. And there's also a lot of, not just uh, vocal communication, a lot of animals also do uh, what you call it, uh, visual communication, so the body gestures and all that. If you look at something like a giraffe, there's not much communication in giraffe at all. And it's all to do with uh, just uh, uh, body behavior and, uh, and they'll pick up on that and then they'll know exactly what's happening and how to move about the, Very much those like gestures. Us. Mm, like mm, us. Body, body language is an important way that we actually communicate with each other as humans yeah. but we don't always notice that we're picking up on somebody else's body language without them saying anything it is, so it's the same yeah, it's amazing it is the same <laughs> I agree it's, it's um, body language is so so important I think with animals with humans uh, it is very important even with lions I mean if you look at lions big time especially at night time when they're hunting it's all about body language you know they're looking at each individual one's looking like it's really now serious with a stalk and they pick up on that and it's like oh oh well that one's serious about a stalk let's do the same oh there's impalas okay let's all get into it you know and it's all visual communication and body communication that's fantastic uh, hmm. Are you ready for our next donation goal? For our generous donors who contribute 100 US dollars or more, we're offering a once in a lifetime private safari experience. You will be able to choose Lauren, Steve, or Cedric as your personal guide and enjoy an authentic private wild earth safari. Let's hit that donation goal and embark on an unforgettable journey through the wilderness together.
So basically, if you take a look at their structure, females, territorial over their little nests, inside that big lump of nests, they're called lodges. And then you have males, we have almost like harems, with the higher ranking males will have a very high proportion of nests that they guard, as opposed to the lower ranking ones, the subordinate ones usually only have one or two, and sometimes none. They're also cooperative at times, and there's even some brood parasite or parasitic females being reported where some females might even just lay eggs in other females' nests, which is quite interesting. And it is the males who actually build those nests cooperatively. The females are the renovators. They will do the lining inside those chambers within that big nest. And indeed, nothing like a walk in the bush to soothe the soul. And talking about that, it's a pity that we don't do the bush walks here anymore. Uh, it's just the natural evolution of what we do out here. Um, I do miss it. I still do walking. Um, not necessarily here at times, but I occasionally will go and do trails. It is something I do sometimes when I'm not here. But uh, it is it is in fact lovely to, to walk. Right, back to the buffalo weavers. We've established how the nests are built as well as the social structure. So once the nest is built, so the this area You know, you breed throughout summer mostly, sometimes even into winter if the conditions are good. And then each female will lay about between two and four eggs. And in intervals. And then it takes roughly about two weeks to incubate before they hatch. And then those nests will be home to the chicks for roughly up to around about 20 days, sometimes a bit longer, depending on the intervals at which the eggs are laid. After which those youngsters then move out. Very successful, very successful species in terms of their breeding strategy. And they're so common that it's often overlooked. And that's the beauty of sitting watching these things in a live show. They've left now probably to gather some more nesting material or food. And like I said, you're watching this as it unfolds. It's live. And therefore, also interactive. Which means you have an opportunity to ask me questions. Which I can answer as it gets fed to me. As well as comments. If you want to let us know about something, there is an opportunity to do that. And how you can do that is to head over to our app. If you're watching on the app, you have to to register in order to be able to ask questions or send comments and for those who are watching via YouTube you need to subscribe to the channel and that will then enable you to receive some notifications 
from Wild Earth if you've got any amazing content that will be on. Now you can hear that those birds are back now. And then I'm going to do my little short walk very soon. Just on the edge of the water, just to check if there's perhaps no lion tracks. And then we'll head, we'll head a little bit more westwards. One of the one of the major predators of these birds are in fact that bird flying there. That bird, that big, big raptor flying there. Wow, there's a nice opportunity. That's a gymnogene or the African hairy oak. I'm just gonna get out of the way so the panda can follow it. And they've got these double jointed knees and they can actually dig out those. Where's it going now? They can actually dig out the, the chicks of these weavers. Wow, <laughs> just like that. The gymnogene or African harrier hawk. Probably looking to distract these birds and then might want to try and snatch one or two of the chicks if there's any. Not easy, they will mob it, they'll gang up on it. That was pretty neat. Captured nicely, Panda. Anyway, I'm gonna do my little walk around for tracks. Let's now head over to Rexon to get an update on his progress. Thank you from Chris uh, from Prideland. We are back to Juma here. We are looking on the cut line. We had the line calling. Look like uh, they are more into our left. The two tracks of a male lion that cross out from our access gate up to the north. Maybe they are slowly coming this way. But what we have read further back, we have realized that uh, Molowati is moving to the east on Gari cut line headed straight south. So uh, later on, it's something that we can follow up on Central, Gary Catlan, Gary Dam, to the east on that area. Maybe he might be walking there, but he might be still full. What he does most of the time, you might find a very suitable area where he can lie down and look around and just um, relax for the rest of the day. Or he might be on patrols, because it's in the nature of a male a leopard, after he'd be not moving for two days, on static on one area so you have to patrol his area because it's more important to keep other leopards away from his territory and also to the threat of the youngster offspring that might be with the leopard if it doesn't move quite a lot in the area and patrolling that might be an inviting more leopards that are, are nomadic in the area even not if it's a nomadic could be TP that uh, want, uh, decided to extend his area furthermore into the east. So he has to find the scent of uh, a dominant male all the time, ready talking on the area that uh, he's a dominant male in the surrounding. Let's move along this uh, cut line. Maybe we might be lucky. Is where we think uh, Cedric is following tracks of lions. If they're not coming into the point, they might be still around in the area where the buffalo are. In the west is nothing. It was only that audio of a lion that were coming, but it uh, seems like it's still in Befesuk. We have no access to drive in Befesuk to find that, and we haven't had report on anybody driving in the north if they find the lions. Let's try to check along. Maybe it will be something interesting. You know that Mlowati like Befesuk Dam, and move to the east sometimes. It's got a, yeah, it does have. Andre asking why are we seeing Mulawat being often? Slowly by sure, winter it's here, I believe. 
that's one of the things. It's not that much thick. It's still thick. The only thing here is the grass. We need buffalo to really come into the area, flatten the grass. But most of the leaves from the trees, uh, the trees are shedding out the leaves. You see quite a lot of um, uh, leopards this time of the year. Even next month, it will be even more leopards. So it's easy to, to see leopards. And also, it's winter now. It's a lot of windy where it gives more lions and leopards the advantage to hunt and successful. After he hunts and, or a kill that we can able to spot, we're able to find a leopard and able to see them uh, quite often. You might be right. We're still looking forward for uh, more of Mlowati and other leopards that might be in the area. It have started uh, down uh, west. Uh, I listen to the radio. They always find leopards. So it's coming slowly by shore. It depends with the different, different habitat that we on. We are on a very lot of complete time. If you look at here, they're still hanging on the leaves. And um, in the next two weeks, it will be all down. So it will be easy to find leopard and the other species that uh, move within this area. And short is getting less thick at the present. Yeah, we've been fortunate. I think it's a strange, uh, this uh, this tent of mine now, I think the leopard that I've seen the most so far is Mulwati. It's, it's never the case, never the case, but it seems like this, uh, this tent so far is um, it's a Mulwati stunt. All right, I've just did a little bit of a loop around just to take a look where these uh, lions are, but I didn't see anything cross crossing into Torchwood. I know that the buffalo, they're busy crossing into Torchwood going east, uh, but I don't see the lions. I'm just going to go one more time up here and then I will try and move on maybe towards Bifflesuk Dam, take a look around that side as well. We did have a hyena that came in earlier. Well, at least the sun is coming out, that's nice. I was really hoping for the sun this morning and uh, there it is. thing I can think is that these lions went in here and then they went across really early last night they already went into Torchwood um, so that's the only thing that I'm thinking now if I'm not or if I'm not lucky Squizzles here, put my nose in here quickly. This is where they had the kill two days ago. I just, want to see, so I just saw a little bit of something moving there, but I'm not too sure what it was. Okay, my little walk around didn't yield any results, so we will then head out and go and find another area to target. Just having a nice blissful moment here at the water hole. It's always nice to just sit and spend time, even if there's no animals. It's just a, a nice thing to do. Did see some impalas running around somewhere, but they disappeared. 
and sometimes you're lucky. You know, I've had many times where I just randomly stop at a water hole for no reason, just to have some peace, and a leopard or a lion approaches. It does happen. It does happen sometimes. Mandy, good day. Wants to know if there are any water snakes in South Africa. Yes, there are some water snakes. There are also some snake species that move into water. Most snakes are very good swimmers. I've seen plenty. I've seen mambas, pythons into the water. So the water snakes that we have in South Africa, the most common ones, what are actually named water snakes is the brown and the green water snakes. So those are two actual water snakes, named water snakes in, 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 in our country. But a number of snakes will move over water if they need to. Very good swimmers, most of them. Things like pythons actually sometimes even use water to hunt where they lie submerged, almost like a crocodile. South African python. I've seen them, plenty of them sometimes lurking in the water. The South African python, formerly known as the rock python. It's now officially known as the South African python. But most snakes are extremely good swimmers. It's a vital skill because in Africa we do have rivers and so forth. So as a species, in order to populate a wide area, crossing bodies of water is an important skill that they need to have in order to maintain distribution of the species in a larger area. And water shouldn't be an obstacle that they cannot cross. I've not seen water snakes here. They're normally not found in pan sized dams like this. It's usually slow flowing rivers. Usually, typically, we'll find the brown and the green water snakes. And we also have a sea snake. We even have sea snakes along our coast. Yellow-bellied sea snakes. One of the most venomous snakes around, by the way. With a very strong myotoxin. Myotoxin attacks muscles. It attacks muscles, paralyzes skeletal muscles. I've not seen a lot of snakes this time around in summer out here. As many as I thought I would. And that's purely chance. I don't think there's any reason to that. Chance, wrong place, wrong time thing. Did see a few mambas, a couple of buff adders. Not a lot of cobras. Not seen many cobras out here. Normally things like 
and phases. Well, spitting cobra is normally quite common. But anyway, let's um, quickly head over to Andrew at Medikwe and ask him perhaps if he's seen a lot of snakes in the summer. Thanks, Chris. Very interesting topic that you've got going there. And yes, I have seen snakes, quite a few, but the most memorable sighting, and it was with Morris. So maybe if uh, Chris can sort of relay this to Morris, who's the tracker there at Pridelands, um, we actually had a, a sighting of an African rock python on a very hot summer's day, busy um, just, you know, basking in the water, in the warm water, and just enjoying it. So that was a cool sighting. It was in the early morning as the day was starting to get very hot. But yeah, we've, uh, we've tried our luck with uh, trying to find some lions. Um, I know one of the Mahiwa brothers were spotted this morning. So we got very close to the area. But unfortunately, they um, did walk into a very, very tricky zone to follow. So all the guides pulled back and are going to wait for them to pop out if they do. But it does seem like one of the Mahiwas is very interested in mating with one of the females there. And so we're actually hoping to, to see that with you. But one thing we are broadcasting very well here in Medikwe Game Reserve is of course our good friends the Impala. They always seem to be our backup plan because uh, one thing about Medikwe is the size. So um, we have to drive far distances to sometimes try our luck with anything that's been spotted on the reserve. And then also when we track we need to sort of drive long distances. And so when uh, you know between you know finding some other things um, we often use Impalas as our backup plans just so that we can keep you informed with what's happening here at Medikwe on this warm morning. Hey, you're battling them, boy, there's one impala, it's just, just sticking around, just a little bit more. But there was a blue wildebeest over here as well. He looked at us and ran off. And I do remember seeing a blue wildebeest with Rian at this very pan. It's a dry wallow, it's called Skoko Pan. Maybe you've heard of it before with the previous naturalists. And it's actually quite a nice place to come in summer because of the, the mud. It's a very good place to find buffalo and then also elephant. And the impalas are feeling a little bit cold this morning. I see their, their backs are looking a little bit dark. So they're all rising their fur to make themselves a little bit warmer. But this morning is not particularly cold. Sorry, just going to turn that down. <laughs> All right, so they are just sort of moving off there. Um, let's take a look at this stump over here, Mr. Mpo. That's quite a unique stump that's, that's over there. So this has been broken at some points by elephants, and then at another point, or many points, you know, elephants have come up and scratched up against this, this log. And through years and years and years of doing it, the log is becoming extremely, extremely polished off. And uh, it's a really cool little thing for elephants just to scratch themselves. Because the last time I was with Rian, yo, we saw this one bull really having a good old scratch with that stump. But if you ever go into the bush and you go on safari and you see termite mounds and it looks like it's literally been polished or stumps, make no mistakes, animals love to scratch their bodies against it. Sometimes you even find fur there. Now, don't forget about the school registrations. Um, and as you know, that every Wednesday we do the, the kids' drives, which is really fun to do. And it's from around you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, to 4 o'clock. That's Central African time during the sunset safari. And yeah, please do register the schools at uh, wildearth.tv forward slash kids. We'll see you all there on Wednesday. Beautiful. Look at this place. Wow, you can see elephants have really had a good time out here. A lot of stumps out here. There's a lot of debris. It's almost like a storm came through here, breaking the trees and the branches. And that's the effect that elephants have on the environment. Now, in an ecosystem like this, you know, in the bush, um, it's, it's a really good effect that they have on the environment, uh, given the correct numbers. Um, you know, of course, if elephants are in the correct numbers, it's very good for the environment because they make paths through the bush and they open up the bush for the other animals. 
and that creates habitat and walking paths for so many different species of antelopes and smaller little critters. Just look at this. You can see some of the bush is quite short here. So there is uh, some of the vichelias that are growing out there. But then the majority of it is actually sickle bush. And sickle bush is more like a bush. It grows to a certain level and sort of, sort of stops. And I can only imagine this place in the summer months when the sickle bush starts to flower. And you must have a look at it. It's a pretty multicolored flower or bicolored flower if you will. And um, it looks like a Chinese lantern. And that's the other name for sickle bush, Chinese lantern. Beautiful environment, eh? Skoko pan. Wonder what skoko means. It's probably the Tswana language. As uh, you know, a lot of the, this is the, the majority of this area of South Africa is is Tswana speaking people. Just listening to some ring neck doves out here. It's amazing. Every morning we get them. Ray, you're having a bit of withdrawal there. Ah, don't worry. Me, you, we're in the same boat. I know that, uh, yeah, it's been quiet on our front out here in, in the Medique side. But, uh, you know, that's one thing I love about nature is that at any time things can really pick up and... You know, a lot of action starts to happen, but by the same time, things can also quieten down very quickly. No cheetah has been found this morning. Yesterday afternoon, we tried our luck. We didn't find her. Um, and I know some of the other guides were very interested and enthusiastic about showing it to their guests. And they didn't manage to find either, which is... Um, so hopefully this, this morning, she still pops up. There's still very much time. Um, and then also there's that beautiful male cheetah. We have set a new target. Join us as we strive to reach our next donation goal of 11,000 US dollars by the end of June. If we succeed, get ready for an unforgettable survival special in one of our sunset safaris. Witness the incredible skills of Steve and Lauren as they tackle challenging tasks like building shelter, making fire, and finding water and food. Donate now and be a part of Wild Earth's first survival challenge.
looking around you know i'd love all the time if you find that it's not easy to find game and you have to read the tracks i had someone calling us maybe in a radio he might give us a report but i'll wait for cedric to respond on that and maybe they're just putting something or tracks cross, crossing into our, our area it would be nice also to follow up on that maybe a leopard we were gary main we have seen tracks look like uh yeah and zoom me cross into little gary i believe that she's more active around twin dams to the north now i get a little bit of understanding tracks is too small compared to uh kalamba kalamba tracks are slightly bigger than this it could be to me because it's my first time to come across look at the uh, tracks of buffalo and all these buffalo down at us Cedric was viewing this buffalo from this uh, position and all of them they just cross to the east it could be the all grazing that uh, invites them into our uh, touch food because you know that this is the first month of buffalo getting into the area uh, from the west up to uh, the east of big gary touch food and gary uh, Spotty thing, I stay away due to the lines. Yes, Anna, these these things, uh, these two, uh, they avoid one another. You know that the story. If you hear, uh, I move or out. If you move out, I move in. So it's how it works uh, in most cases. So you find that the spotty thing, they are moving out just because of uh, the lions uh, in the area. So I do see how it works. Slowly, we have to be patient. But they cannot move out for good. They have to come back. That is the way. You might find that with the spotty thing going, uh, it's where the line are going to be ended too. Then the spotty thing have to come this way. So the old time given chance and also avoid each other. Because you know, really, really these two uh, species, once they come across with one another, it's always a fight. Let's see, we're gonna go remain and see who is there. Oh, the buffalo went that direction. The lion also that direction. But they look like the lions are ahead and uh, the buffalo coming behind. There will be a huge benefit if you look at the ground here due to the buffalo moving in here. Lots of dung, lots of movement. So it could be lots of things that are happy at the moment. Just think about um, all. You know, what is the chances to see the weather that I've never seen? It's very high. Very, very high. It's winter now, I won't be surprised. It, it might be as we speak, there's a leopard. Don't know, but uh, most of the time, you know, that uh, we still have to find him. But I believe that uh, it could be a leopard that comes from the north, east, any direction of the reserve. It can be a leopard here at any time. We'll see, we are working here. Let's see, at the end of this week what we have found and what we have achieved here. Uh, it's look like it can be a change by any second. Possible. It is possible. There's reason you never know what is around the corner. All the time, you have to have patience what you're doing. It might happen.
let's take this opportunity over to Cedric and see what he's up to. Thanks, Rex. Uh, yes, we are now just saw a little bit of a bumble here now. Uh, as I said, we have left those uh, buffaloes. They have all gone into Torchwood. Uh, there's no more view on those Cape buffaloes. But now I'm going to head a little bit further on Biffles of Cut Line. I'm going to head west, all the way west towards another dam called Boabab Dam. Uh, I just want to see uh, if anything has popped out from that side. Or look for elephants. I know that. Uh, Andrea loves, loves elephants, so I just want to, to see if we can find a nice herd. It's always nice to have little calves. I think they, they are part of the herd of elephants. Especially when they learn how to use their trunks. It's always hilarious. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes they're just like throwing it around and yeah. swinging it. But yeah, that is... Uh, I think, all right, we'll just have to go stationary yeah I think our signal is just dropping a little bit yeah that's strange but we shall just but yeah those little elephants are amazing I think they are amazing just to tell you, just to take a look at them and sometimes they feel they seem like they are so big you know they like come mock charge a vehicle especially when mom is behind them thinking okay well I'm as big as my mom so I can do just as much as my mom can you know and I love that too. <laughs> Elephants are amazing. Yeah, and just watching them, and just you know, and just uh, observing just their behaviour between the individuals and how much mm -hmm. respect they've got for uh, the older ones, and as well as how protective they are for those younger ones. You know, mm -hmm. so that young one is busy screaming and making a few, I can say, distressed noises and all that. How quickly the whole herd just kind of gathers up there and wow. you know protects that little one and see yeah. what's what's happening, what's wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. so, Amazing, fa amazing family dynamic, actually. It is, yeah. it is. That's why I love elephants. You can watch them for hours. Yeah. Sit at a dam, watch them coming down, and I love it. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to continue, see if we can get into a better signal area. Let's head over to Pridelands to see what's happening with Chris. Right, so as we drive along, you know, we often see these dung pallets around and it can be confused with that of predators. So every now and then I'll just climb out and assess. Right, but what dung do we have if this is not a predator? And you're going to tell me, I'm going to give you hints. Right, let's take a look at the shape and structure of the dung. We can see it's little individual, little sausages, almost like little small cocktail sausages dark in color it's like these little individual it's, it's like little sausages almost all right got a bit of a reddish tinge to it there's there is one of our hints and it's quite fibrous looks like there's some plant material in there all right So what do we have here? What dung, what creature has made that dung? All right, Shreyas, you're just showing off now. <laughs> Indeed, porcupine. It is, in fact, the dung of porcupine. So very typical, it's these individual sausage-shaped dung pellets. Fibrous, because they are rodents, they eat quite a lot of fibrous material, grass, the roots of plants, uh, and then especially the bark of certain trees, most notably the bark of the tamboti tree. And that's that reddish tinge that you get, which you probably can't see with the angle that you have there, is from the tannins found in the bark of the tamboti tree. Remember, tamboti trees are in fact toxic but porcupines extensively nibble on the bark low to the ground. There is in fact a cluster of Tamboti trees up ahead, just down the road. 
and we will probably go there and I can in fact even show you um, if I can find a place where the porcupine has nibbled. So that is indeed that of the porcupine at Dung. It's a very common animal out here, even though we don't really get to see them much, but there's plenty. You can pretty much choose any road out here and you'll find porcupine tracks on it every morning. And the significance, why did I stop here? I just wanted to show you some of the things that can confuse us while we are looking for predators. We see dung like this, we quickly have to stop and check whether it's the dung of a predator or not. Because if it's fresh predator dung, it means we are close to the predator. But in this case, it happened to be the tracks of a porcupine, the largest rodent out here. It's a rat. Well, it's not a true rat, but saying it tongue in cheek, it's a rodent. In the order Rodentia. Hi there, Mike. Uh, would dung beetles use the dung of any animals? Well, most of them. I can't really, out of my head, think of any dung that they won't utilize out yet. I've seen them utilize most species. They do show a preference for the herbivores, but they do utilize most other dung. On that topic, remember that it's winter now, it's a dry season. We don't really see much dung beetles currently. All right, there's that one family of dung beetles that are active at the moment. It's the family Endocopridae, or the Endocoprids as we refer to. So those dung beetles basically target elephant, rhino, and buffalo dung mostly, large piles of dung. And what they do, they lay their eggs on the dung and the larvae stays within that dung. They don't like make balls or anything. They don't dig underneath the dung. They grow inside that dung pile. They're very small dung beetles. The larvae is also very small and they will consume the dung from the inside and that hard outer casing that's dried by the sun and the elements remains a protective cap. So you don't really see them. You have to physically break the dung open to see them. So those are active in the dry season or winter rather, the endocoprids as they are called. But most of the other dung beetle species are inactive at the moment. We will see them again once summer starts and more specifically when the rainy season starts. So they're not here all year around or at least not active all year around. And that's why we do see a lot more undisturbed dung out here as opposed to summer. Great, uh, we just joined these uh, hornbills and starlings. They're talking here. It could be all about collection of the food or it could be something that they've spotted around here. But in most cases, it looks like they're all on the ground. It could be picking maybe uh, ants that are crawling on the ground itself. Because hornbill are very fond eating uh, ants or termites that might be moving on the ground itself. Look at that. That is uh, yellow bill hornbill. Uh, we call it Zazu. You know that the Lion King. This is Zazu. With the all uh, big uh, yellow. And we have a variety of hornbills here. We have trumpet, we have red, we have grey. Such a beautiful to see. But these guys look like 
So all the time you mix up with the other species as far as starlings, foctail, drongo and respond quite a lot in lamb calls that are made by other species and, and be part of uh, the mob and try to force whatever bunt me in the area out. Great, uh, we, we still with this handball, which uh, really sometimes I would refer this the best, best okay. uh, breeding of uh, or success breeding animal or bird out in the bush in most cases. You know, when uh, you can stand by, but that five nana here, but they already, as I told you, with five young Madonna and one Avoca. Cool, man. Nice. Nice to hear that from uh, Abel. The Avaka or Mohawk with the f uh, four youngster that are approaching Torchwood Water and approaching the uh, breeding head of uh, Buffalo. It's such amazing to hear that. We'll, we'll keep uh, updating you which direction they're going. We're not far from that area. If they started to um, focus on the Buffalo, they might push the buffalo back into Viatala. It's about less than four to five hundred meters where they are, and it really would be nice to see them back into the area as all five uh, males. Unbelievable. Back to these um, hornbills. Lot more successful how they nest. They find a tree that does have hole and uh, let the female go inside and the male will go fly out, look for insect, and the hole, it will be sealed by the mud that they collect from the water holes we have in the area, and only left the uh, big, uh, big uh, to access food in and out. Otherwise, they don't want snakes to get inside. So breeding of these uh, hornbills around in the area, they are so much successful. These are the best successful out in nature. When it comes to parental care, I mean, hornbill is the, is the best because all the time they give safety for the youngster as a first peer preference. Wow. Which bag is the biggest and smallest tracks? You look at the, look at the blue uh, wax bull, it's the smallest, I believe, uh, under the regard when it comes to tracks. But uh, the biggest bird, look at the ostrich, of course, uh, uh, ground hornbills, and all that. These are the biggest tracks, of course, of all species out in nature. Hornbill, I mean, Ostrich is a part of the bed that we, we call it into the area. Is the one that have huge tracks. Look like someone have walked there and of course in the size of human being. So that is the biggest tracks that we have witnessed in the area. It's picking a uh, lot of uh, which we don't see here. We don't have binoculars, but of course it's something that's eatable. It could be black ants, it could be whatever, I can't tell. And most of the time, I don't see, they can see the seeds of a grass this time of the year because buffalo has been here and uh, elephant has been here. They can pick them, but not the way. You can see they look around, turn the head in order to see what might be moving here. How oh, lovely. Beautiful. Let me take this opportunity riding to the east. Uh, lions are moving parallel uh, with the waterfall. Maybe uh, what be coming straight to um, Loanini. Who knows? As they're moving, they might uh, cross shortly into the Chita Chita. We'll just give it like 10 15 minutes 
there might be over to the other side. And uh, it really, I've been waiting to see more hoko, the sub adults, and all together. I wonder, I wonder where there might be when he does have a kill with that uh, young male. I believe that uh, it could be something to witness there. The one able to let the young male join. That's reason he went his own direction, knowing that uh, danger is coming. I take this opportunity and link over to Andrew. Awesome, thank you, Rexon. Okay, so we're gonna do a plant segment now, and most of you are probably going to be able to identify this plant. This is one of the guaris that grows out here. And uh, one thing I've noticed about this stretch of road that we, we drive down over here is that there's a lot of guaris. And uh, just this little spot over here, there's so many over here, and it's just such a nice green color, because as you can see, it's this, this sort of lighter green. So when you're driving through here and it's all sickle bush and like a lot of corky plants and then suddenly it's this beautiful green color over here. All right, so let's go through a few uses of a guari bush. And I'm gonna demonstrate something, two things actually. So yes, guari bush firstly can be used as a toothbrush as we know. A lot of the previous naturalists have probably done segments on it before. A lot of you will know this, but there'll always be new people all the time. So, we'll go through it again. So what you do to make a toothbrush, you just come to a branch just like this. Simple. And what you do is you remove all that outer bark. And it actually comes off quite easy. Most of the time you can actually remove it with your fingernail. But it's always handy to have a... Leatherman. All right, so then what you do is bark is gone. You can use your teeth, but you can also just use a plier just to spread out the fibers. You see that? And it actually becomes quite a cool little brush. And that could be used to brush your teeth. You see that? Now, in the, the Bushman times, how they would brush their teeth is they would actually take ash from one of the trees called a leadwood. And now the ash from the leadwood has actually got quite a, an abrasive com compound, that's the word. It's an abrasive compound, much like your toothpaste. That would be used just to scratch the teeth nice and clean, take in some water. They would spit that out, and then they would come to the guari over here, and then get in between all those places that they couldn't necessarily get with their finger. But there's another use for this tree. Now, I've got an example somewhere over here, and here is my example. Okay. Now, I actually saw this uh, with Andre at Pridelands, and he demonstrated it, and it was fascinating. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But guari has been, some of the guari species have been, uh, been known to be called magic guari. And the reason is because um, you can use it to div divine water. So what is divining water? It's taking a branch like this and using it as a tool to help you understand where there's groundwater. I know it sounds bizarre, this is wood, how? I have no idea, it's actually quite a crazy thing. But what you do is, you take a wire branch like that, and you see there? And the way they demonstrated it, let me just get this right. Okay, so the way he demonstrated it was, and this is Andre, one of the instructors, was you take the branch just, okay, no, sorry, it was your, with, with the, the, the pinkies. And you spread the branches apart. Oh, it actually broke there. But anyway, so you spread the branches apart and, and you walk in the bush. And as soon as you actually get to an area where there's water, the branches literally twist down. They move down. And you can use it as an indicator for water. You see that? So let me just show it to you again. I'm, I'm sorry, it did, uh, did break. And I don't think we have time to put, uh, put some of the camera tape around it. But anyway, so that's the wire branch. Using one pinky, one pinky, but it has to be intact though. Sorry, it did break. And they would spread the branches apart, just like that, okay? And then when walking through the bush, boom, 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 you strike water, boom, 
the branch literally twists down and goes down like that. How cool is that, eh? I found that am amazing. And as soon as I figured out that it actually works, I was walking up and down, up and down, trying to find out where the water was under the ground. But there's something else I want to show you here. Now these have gone very dry at the moment, so they're not going to be very tasty, but they are actually berries that come along with this tree species. Look at these little berries. I'm just going to hold it in my hand, open there so Mpo can get it. How's that Mpo? Look at those little, those little um, berries. So almost the size of a BB pellet. Those little toy guns that you, you shoot around, those yellow pellets and orange pellets and so on. So it's more or less that size. And when they grow, they are black and you can eat this. And it's also used as a dye. Isn't that interesting? Look at it. Oh, thanks, Nancy. You enjoyed that explanation. Thank you. I do enjoy explaining it. And guari is one of those plants that I really do enjoy because um, there's so many actual uses for it. So I'm just going to put these seeds down. Okay, plan to use for a dye. But then also, look how springy this plant is. If I come up to it, look, look at this. You see how springy it is. So now, in the times of the hunter-gatherers and the bushmen, when they used to go out into the field and and, and hunt something, they would slaughter, slaughter the animal in the bush. But then they would come to this plant and they would put it on the ground and they would put the meat on top so that it could keep it out the way of scarab beetles and uh, you know, maybe other scavengers and so on. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Those sounds just go straight through you. Just off-roading here, we just um, about 300 meters back, we find uh, uh, guinea fowls uh, lambing and there's tracks of uh, a leopard cutting to my left, right I mean, going towards east, very close to your uh, touchwood uh, cut line, look like everything's going in touchwood, unless if you're still walking here, 
we were able to find him. You know, Franklin can take uh, 10, 15 minutes just talking while the animal is going, but the text is getting in between here, moving to the east. If not, uh, just cross finger to find the tracks here. If it's going along Chita Cut Line, if it's crossing, we can able to follow up. And we just drive here about uh, 15 minutes ago. If there's anything on top of a vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, we're able to follow up. Alas, what is the favorite of uh, leopard name and the meaning? Uh, I'll, I'll favor the name of uh, a leopard that goes with the character of that particular leopard that I love, of course. It's Talamba. You know, Talamba, it's more like it suits her name. She's always moving, jumping, running, doing all of that. As I'm following a, a suspect could be here that moves in the area, I'll be checking up in the trees on the termite, and checking uh, the tracks at the same time because she likes to play a lot. That means playful. That is the name that uh, I'm going with and uh, it, it really meaning the, the, the character of the leopard is always do the same. Uh, I'm suspecting maybe she might cross to the east. We have no rights to the other side, but what we do, we'll stick on this road here to the east towards Mluanini. If there's any chance of her uh, crossing into Chita Chita, avoiding this angle, it's want to come from the uh, Mluanini itself back into Chitwa because it do make sense as a leopard. You cannot walk into an open space at the meantime you're hunting. Look like uh, there's tracks here, I'm not sure yet. I'll find more about it. Let's try to drive, but the tracks look like good. As I'm driving, I feel like uh, I have to check the crossing, I have to check the amount there's a water. Water walk, walking there. Let me turn to the left. Yeah. Fire break. Show you the water. I know that uh, female leopard. Female leopard cannot hunt water unless if it's a piglet involved. A fully grown warthog, it can stand a chance and fight back. It's almost where the leopard went. There's really, oh, there's a baby, there's a big little ones here. Maybe let, let's see if it could be leopard in the area. If there's a leopard, we can hear this warthog running. Soon they get the scent. Amazing. <laughs> Kathy likes Shidulo on Shidulo. Yeah, it makes sense, Kathy. Shidulo on Shidulo, it will be the best uh, to to find that leopard and also the character of the leopard likes to see. This is how, what talks are running away. But uh, definitely, maybe they get the scent to decided to dive out from the way where the leopard might be. You'll never know. Uh, easy to disappear into the thicket. 
We carry on and head towards the east. Uh, we'll be uh, looking around and come back in the same spot and see what uh, it might be here. Sapi sapi. There's a fresh text of Ingwe going parallel with Gary Main uh, to the east. Yeah, Feb. Let me know. Let's quickly link to Andrew and see what's up to. We're trying to find this leopard here. Rexon, we are up to watching zebra and there's a couple of giraffes here as well. It's pretty, pretty sweet. Now that young zebra, it's getting quite big now, but still trying to get some milk from mom and it's going to need to bend down quite far to reach it it becomes quite difficult and awkward the bigger and bigger they get very nice now there's two big big female giraffes here there's one walking through the bush there she could be pregnant but she's just gone behind the bush it's just amazing to see the condition of all the animals out here all the animals i've seen have been in impeccable condition i've only seen one animal that looked like it uh, you know, could have been sick um, and that was a black back jackal and it didn't have much of a tail so it seems like mange is kicking into that uh, that black back jackal that we saw but the rest of the animals wow incredible condition Yeah, that's uh, one of the problems that, you know, canines and foxes and just... Hail to thee, blithe spirit. Bird thou never wert. that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest. Like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest And singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. Well, as you can see, we are sitting here on uh, a plane called Impala Plains, and we've got a beautiful female warthog that is just staring us down. Oh, no, she is deciding to move off. But you can see a female because it's only got the one set of warts. If it was a male, it will have two sets of warts, one below the eyes, and one between the eyes and the nostril or the nose area. But other than that, it is just by itself. Usually you'll find females, you'll find the daughters or little piglets that remain with the, the females, but this one is all by itself at the moment. And I love warthogs. I think they are, they are interesting animals and they look quite strange, but they, mm. they are beautiful in a way. In some ways. I mm. love it when they actually run and they, go, they lift their tails up like an aerial. Yeah. So it's like a little follow me sign for the others to follow. Especially that they are so short. Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the other day, we saw a leopard and they had a water mm. kill. So they had lions on a water kill. Sure. So, um, 
So they need to be quite alert. Hmm. I always think of that. I can't remember what movie it was, but where the warthog says, they call me Mr. Pig. Oh, uh, li well, Lion King. Lion King, yeah, Lion there we King, go. Yeah. <laughs> Pumba. Yes, uh, Mr. that's Pig. it. There we go. But the funniest part about that is, now the first Lion King that came out, of course, is uh, it was a female warthog. You know that. Oh. Was, yeah, because they did not, that warthog in the first Lion King only had one set of warts. So, of course, when the new Lion King came out, I think it was about, what, four or five, five years ago, they, of course, they changed it, they had to change it, and, of course, uh, it was a male warthog because then they had two mm. sets of warts, so they had to change it up. So, yeah, interesting. <laughs> very interesting. And the, and the warthog on Lion King, the first one was purple, so it wasn't really yeah. the, well, not yeah. purple, purple, but it was kind of had that purple tinge to it. So, as you can see, a, a warthog does not have any pur purple pigments pigmentations yeah. on it so yeah that's so a complete gray animal and then, of course the new one is gray so yeah so they sorted that out but yes i love it or oh, mr pig akuna matata yeah so it should have been mrs pig actually. it should have yeah the first one should have been mrs pig uh, in, a, in a higher voice yeah i'm mrs pig yeah. excuse me <laughs> But yeah, but they are beautiful. I still, I still love, especially with the little piglets, especially when mm. they've got those little piglets, little youngsters, and they all follow mom and they are so curious. And sometimes they just bounce around. They're like little bouncing beans, you know, those mm. little jumping beans. Yeah. yeah. And they remind me a lot of that when they, when they're very small, because they're always like hopping around and <laughs> doing little flick flacks. But yeah, it's uh, well. We're going to continue, I think, with uh, our driver. Let's go. I just want to go a little bit further down because I'm just interested in getting to Zoe's uh, and just to see if any leopard tracks are, have pretty much come across from the western sector into the east. But while we do that, uh, yeah, let's see what else we can find. Great, lovely. We uh, we have an update with the lions. There are three females, five males. They're all lying down at the moment uh, inside uh, Torch Torchwood. We are leaving Chito Chito now. There's nothing much happening this side. We'll head uh, straight to the, the west, slowly, slowly back into the area of Juma Conservancy. Maybe you might find leopard or something there, who knows, it is uh, really impossible to find something all the time. Because these animals, they have freedom of uh, movement. They don't stay in one area. Even those lions, we'll, we'll see this afternoon where they might be. As buffalo heading towards Chito Chito uh, Dam, and I believe that uh, they might stay behind. It looks like promising weather can change at any time. It can be overcast. It will be nice if we leave early this afternoon and try to work around Chita Chita up to Gary Main if there's any tracks of those lines crossing over to Chita. Maybe the buffalo will return back into Juma. From Chita Chita, they will head back towards uh, Leadwood Chita Chita cut line. Uh, Chita cut line, I mean back into the north and the buffalo won't spend time going south they might return back into Juma Conservancy and by now by that we we're able to see those uh, Kohuma pride I love to see all those males sticking together it will be something but I still believe that uh, Mohawk is going to stay with the young boys the way it sounds and the way it looks. It might get uh, an extra collation, like a young male that we saw yesterday, to join, that can happen, and move all together, being six. Another travel in service is coming, another Mapoho, you'll see it will happen. Those four young males, The four male plus one, it's a, a lot more powerful condition. If it happens that the young male that we saw yesterday join and make it six, 
it's unbeatable. They can uh, really uh, drive uh, from this corner up to the south, and they can dominate from Manyeleti all the way down to uh, Sabi River. And uh, then they can, nobody can really stop them moving in the area because there's manpower within the structure of six coalitions or five coalitions. So it's where you can see quite a lot of uh, lions would get killed, especially young male like uh, the Sapada from Kuhumas. They will not going to let anybody to sleep out if they get out because they have energy, still young. They're not big enough, they can run, they can chase. They have that uh, ambition to kill and make it their own way they want, uh, their own structure into service. And remember, when Mapoho gets here, you almost they wreck, they wreck and they kill 60 up to 70 percent lion's population in the service sense. That's the reason you find that population of lions you cannot able to tell at the moment, but we see us as stable. It could be area where we are, but in area where there's a new males in a very big collection, like this young male and Mohawk, if they take over, there's a lot of damage on the prides because they have to move from one pride to another to make sure the female accept them. And if they get accepted, what does? They kill all the offspring and let the female start. If a female resists, they kill even the females. So is how actually you tend to find lots of lions populations in the area that get killed. Not only from the lions, hyena in competitions, buffalo in fight. So always the number is really low. Um, I've read one day, last two months back, you can imagine how big is the uh, Great Akuga National Park where we have uh, 2,500 uh, lions. In entire Great Akuga National Park is the size of a country. And uh, of course, you can find different pride in the area, but they don't make it due to disease. Competition is huge. And the leopard, uh, the one that I record with the leopard, I can really understand because most of the time, a leopard is very exclusive. The leopard that recorded in entire the Great Akuga National Park, 1,500 and a couple of numbers there. Those are, it makes sense because it's not all the leopard that can be seen and calculated. Some of them, they're living in a very thick, they're very skittish. You cannot even you put a camera trap. Some of them, they're not moving on those areas. It could be more leopard, but those are the leopard that they can able to uh, count them and able to know them and they relax from vehicles. It's easy. While we are talking about the stats of leopards and lions, let's go over to Chris in Pryland. You can tell more about Pryland that's at how many lions or legs and leopards. Right, the northern parts of the conservancy is rather uneventful, quiet, so we are now en route to the central parts. Uh, I did hear some elephants around the dam where I was, but um, we couldn't find them, I did see tracks. Let's head back to the central part around our camp. Uh, there's also water all there in Glovu Dam. I'm going to try and see if there's not perhaps any elephants there. That's where we started off this morning with that uh, sunrise and my old buffalo friend, Wim Brutus. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, we're going to see if there's not perhaps some elephants around there or perhaps any sign of cats. Other than that, uh, a bit quiet on our side in the morning. OK, we've had some interesting discussions and we're going to continue to look for interesting things. Driving a little bit faster than usual because I want to get there. I'm going to actually, you know, I'm driving through a relatively dead area. It's on a top of a granite rise. Uh, grass species up here are not as nutritious as down in these valleys. 
So it's generally speaking a relatively quiet Every cell that makes up the wonders of our natural history needs this life-sustaining molecule. Sometimes in tiny amounts, sometimes in torrents. Our blue planet, flush with biological wonders, would be a desolate, lifeless place without miraculous H2O. Great, lovely, lovely, lovely. It's nice to uh, drive here and look at uh, different areas we are on a road called Drankersberg Drive. Unfortunately, it's not sun setting. You can see Drankersberg Range from here we are. This is the most beautiful, beautiful road that I love to travel. Talking about Pride of Line, it just uh, really makes me more excited and able to know the different pride that we have here. I just want to thought, have a thought this uh, uh, morning before I cut to Chris, how many Pride of Lines that we have seen here in total, different pride like Kuhumas, uh, Machingis, Mapoho, Matimba. Uh, we have Torchwood, we had uh, Sandy Patch, we did had uh, Monzo, we did had uh, I mentioned Kuhuma Telamati, uh, and also we had this Kutana pride. It, it, it's really when I remember the, the name is Kutana. Kutana Pride is one of the pride. All of them, when they get here, they were limping. They were, they were boxers, fighters. They were really fighters. They used to fight all the time. Uh, they fight anything that they come across. So we used to name them Kutani Pride. They were like 11 female, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's been a long time. So all this pride in history, background of our area, they've been here in, in Juma Conservancy. Uh, since I've been involved in 2000, 2001, started in Juma. So I've seen all these different pride that uh, went through in the area. Uh, sticks also were here for long. And uh, we did have, uh, as far as yes, we have uh, pride that comes from south, uh, called Salala Pride. They've all been operating in this territory and come and go. So now, and what makes them come and go in the area, same, same reason is still even today taking place. Co strong collisions of males is it's, it's really, really obstacle to uh, really reduce and drive some of the pride off from the area, especially males. If they come into power, having more individual members in, in collisions, they start to misuse the power that they have is to kill and some of the pride will be driven off not to come back because the fear for their life. You know, with these young boys, I'm talking today, uh, what's going to happen with this four and uh, Mohawk, this danger is coming. I believe that uh, it's nice because they started here. They're not going to stay here. They're going to move somewhere else, down south. All these male, black day males that are operating here, they're all gonna be pushed out. Furthermore, maybe east, they'll uh, conquer the area up to the south, and no body, can, no males can challenge them and be successful. It's a very strong collision. Um, I'm sure Mohawk is lucky to stay. If he stay on that uh, collision of the or on those subadults until they see the light and start to challenge, it will be amazing. Amazing, amazing.
Not everyone gets excited to hear a leopard chuff, spot a pangolin, or see a real impala rut. But if you are wild about the wild, you can become part of a community of like-minded nature lovers and share authentic wildlife experiences with the world. Join the Explorers Club and you will also enjoy the many benefits that come with it too. Wild with Explorers, it's in your nature. at the dam back at the dam and we don't have an animal here but i want to show you something so on the water surface we see this sort of blue green sheen and we've discussed it a few times uh, and that's not an algae even though they're called blue green algae it's called cyanobacteria it's a specific type of bacteria now before we get to the bacteria why it's significant for me now you can see this sheen is spread over much of the surface and that indicates that there's not been heavy animals that recently came to drink because they will create waves buffalo moving into the water elephants moving into the water and the waves will push this bacteria to the side of the edge of the water so it's relatively undisturbed so we obviously haven't had any big animals drinking now so we can use that as an indicator anyway we discussed this a few times. Blue coloration or greenish. So these are phototrophic bacteria, which means they photosynthesize like plants. Well, they are plants, in fact, bacteria are plants. So how does that happen? Remember that plants that photosynthesize uses carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, energy from the sun, and then pigments, certain photosynthetic pigments, such as chlorophyll, which is green, by the way. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other photosynthetic uh, pigments that can also do that. There's uh, carotenoids, for instance. Uh, there's phycobilins as well. Those are all pigments that can aid with photosynthesis or facilitate that. And then the result is they release oxygen. That's a byproduct. That chemical reaction releases oxygen. That's why plants are so important to us. They oxygenate our planet. And in fact, this cyanobacteria are thought to be some of the first organisms to produce oxygen early on in Earth's history. During a time when the atmosphere was relatively oxygen poor. And this was known as the Great Oxidation Event or the rusting of the planet 
which turned our atmosphere into an oxygen-rich environment, allowing for other forms of life to, uh, to, 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 to flourish. So they play a vital role in releasing oxygen. The problem with this bacteria is that they also produce toxins. They produce toxins, poisons, that can actually be released into the water or if animals consume them accidentally through drinking water, they can actually ingest these toxins, also known as cyanotoxins, referring to a toxin produced by the cyanobacteria. And not to be confused with cyanide, it's non-related to cyanide at all. So that can kill animals as well. Even indirectly, those toxins can accumulate in shellfish, for instance. And we can ingest that and actually also you know, suffer from the toxins. Think about things like freshwater mussels. If they were to occur in this lake or this pond, there's a chance that those would have absorbed those toxins and it would accumulate. So that would not be a good idea to look for mussels in a place like this. Uh, freshwater mussels, uh, it's better to look for them in dried riverbeds or, or, or shallow riverbeds where there's flowing water because you often don't really find the cyanobacteria in flowing water. They don't like flowing water at all. And the cyanotoxins are somewhat neurotoxic and that's how it actually do a lot of damage to us if ingested but coming back to their purpose they do provide a lot of oxygen to the planet so it's a bit of a trade-off between good and bad Lovely and peaceful. Anyway, let's head over to Rexon now to see what he's got for us. Lovely, thank you so much. Uh, we were stopping here. It was be a beautiful, beautiful uh, little hat of Impala that uh, just take off to our right, not far from us. But what is more important that I've learned today is all species in general, it's not only the uh, ox peckers that uh, benefit uh, from um, herbivore. You tend to see hornbull, uh, starling, magpie shrike, they all benefit. They have very good symbiotic relationship. They follow this head of impala as a stand, uh, starling have moved off. Let me show you something that is more important. This commercialism symbiotic relationship is very high of all different species, but especially we tend to see now in winter because it's more, there's no much food to collect. You know that winter, it tend to be slow. There's no lots of grasshoppers that they can benefit. So all these hornballs, magpie shrike, uh, starling, they stay behind the head of impala. When the impala graze and chase, step in, uh, insects on the ground even if it's a small lizard they go for it because they're so desperate to eat there's nothing much that can collect in the area some of the species so you know that they're free to war they can eat fruits they can eat they, they mix up uh, they can eat even grasshoppers so they try as much as they can if they fly themselves in the area they cannot disturb the insect on the ground so what does they stay behind heads of impala so everything is connected in nature so one support this in way in different way so it happens that if a steer if a starling is there hornbull is there 
and uh, uh, magpie is there, a magpie truck is there, Impala, they're always saved. So I might say that uh, it's a commercial symbiotic relationship. Meanwhile, it's not. It's uh, all of them, they, they benefit. It could be a uh, mutualism co uh, symbiotic relationship. Both species benefit at the same time because if they do see danger, of course, they cannot uh, really be quiet with the Impala because they don't benefit from the leopards. They benefit from the Impala. They will give a lamb call. And it's only today that I realize this uh, all species they benefit from one another. Of course, there's no doubt if they get to see danger as a magpie shark, as a starling, as a hornbow, they will let the presence of danger to impala because they benefit on the impala, they don't benefit on the leopard, and they will make the uh, leopard aware by the, the presence of a lion or leopard, and the impala can able to move out. You can see that same with the uh, tree squirrel, once they get uh, danger, they will shout to let the other species know. It's not just because they do that purposely because uh, they get need to talk. They know that they benefit quite a lot. There's a link in between the impala and them because as they move and the impala will go and eat amarul and come and drop the seeds on, on the ground or also the defecation as crude and others, I mean squirrel will come and pick that and they cannot just eat the um, amarula as raw as it is. It needs to be processed with one of these antelope that they can do, uh, uh, able to access them and eat them. It's exactly the same with the species we have seen today here. Such amazing. When they get to see danger, they'll let impala benefiting and the bird benefiting a lot. So all of them, they really benefit, no doubt. It's unbelievable. You can see Taiwan again. There's bird on the frame that uh, flew down, up and down. It's something that we need to follow up and understand it very clearly. Sometimes it's very quick with the research. We decide, oh, this is, could be this kind of of relationship. Look at that. That's a folk tail jungle that we, we, we're seeing at the moment. When we stop at the earlier on, there's combination of species of birds. And now the fox trail drongo is on. He said, ha, let me benefit. I'll take care of you, Impala. If anything comes, I'll shout. Wakisha, it's always. That's I love, I love, I love, I love my game drive. I love nature because you always learn on a daily basis. There's no way. This is a university of life. And some of the things that we, we come across with it, more especially we as a guide, we see that and analyze it. It teaches our life from our side also in general. If we can copy and look at what the animal do, in most cases, it can benefit us a big time and able to improve in life. This is not a small head of impala, but it's nice for the small head to move in the area. Impala are similar with the elephant. During the course of a night, they will meet at quarantine. And for more eyes, during the course of a day, they will move up in a small pockets there and there in order to accommodate it by the habitat. Okay, well, we're coming up to now the open clearing just south of our camp. And uh, there's gonna. Oh, a little squirrel. Hello, tree squirrel. Sorry, a little tree squirrel has just decided to run across here. Oh, there you go. Good morning, little squirrel. I'm 
they are so active around these areas you can see and so quick because sometimes moving around um, picking up some nuts and seeds and they do especially the marula nuts and they'll go and store them in certain areas and when you come to this time of the year of course where they've stored all those little marula seeds they will go and dig them up and feed on them so almost like they've got a little pantry I love it I absolutely love it and as you know uh, where they stay usually the squirrels they'll call it a dray not a nest or a den it's a dray a squirrel a squirrels a dray they're much smaller compared to your ground squirrels that you get over there in Madikwa area because those ground squirrels are about twice the size of a tree squirrel He's gone. He's gone. <coughs> I love how squirrels make that noise. <laughs> Patrick, uh, well, uh, Andrea, Patrick says thank you so much for uh, sharing all your knowledge on the mental health today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Yes, it is so uh, interesting, and I'm I'm learning a lot from uh, Dr. Andrea. Yeah? So I, <laughs> I love it, and it's something very, very uh, special for all, all of us, and it's quite a privilege as well. Oh, look at that little skin bucky! Hello, a little female skin who is always very relaxed here on this open clearing. There is, the male is around here somewhere. You usually see the two of them chasing one another and during the afternoons or actually in the mornings as well. It looks like she's decided to go venturing on by herself. But also uh, comparing to the impalas, you always find the impalas always in those big harems, like the breeding herds. And of course, <laughs> these little stembok book are very much a solitary antelope. Uh, he's running his like, he doesn't want to hang around all shit long. But yes, uh, once again, thank you for so much for joining us on this uh, morning's uh, sun, uh, sunrise safari. Well, we did have a bit of sun this morning, but it seemed like it uh, has uh, disappeared once again. So, um, yeah, we never know what we're going to find again this afternoon. And talk about uh, what's happened this morning as well. We had those buffaloes. Those buffaloes disappeared into Torchwood. And there was lions that was in that block. Unfortunately, that's why those buffaloes disappeared so quickly. Uh, we just couldn't see those lions. But they went all into Torchwood. But I'm hoping this afternoon will be once again a fantastic uh, sunset safari. And uh, once again, I just want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Andrea for you know mm. giving some of your expertise and your stories and all that it's just always fantastic mm. well love. thank you to you I mean your expertise and stories are just as fascinating so. <laughs> thanks Andrea yeah so yeah we will be out again this after this afternoon and thanks to everybody for your questions for your comments your suggestions and uh, yes make sure that you join us this afternoon have a wonderful afternoon goodbye Hello and welcome everyone to a wonderful edition of Live at the Waterhole. It's looking quite overcast here to start with. We're at Jamala Lodge or Jamala Waterhole 